Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, good to see everybody back, and uh, for those of you joining us on television, we want to welcome you to just a simple Bible study. I want to keep it simple. I shared it again with someone the other day. Keep it simple. My, so many people get all wrapped up in things that nobody can figure out. But uh, it's not that difficult if you just keep it simple. So we're just glad to have you on board, and we trust you'll learn and uh, study and learn to use the scriptures so that you can study on your own. Okay, my little wife is the one that keeps things moving, and so she says we haven't shown people our book again for a long time. It's 88 questions with answers taken from our television material, and... Uh, it's been so well received, we, uh, we like to keep promoting it because it's probably one of a kind. Okay, now we're going to continue on with where we left in the previous programs, how that we come through Scripture, <coughs> we move from the call of Abraham and the appearance of the nation of Israel, and all leading up to the promises of a coming king and a kingdom, and Jesus came in fulfillment of all that, and made a legitimate offer to the nation of Israel to have the king and the kingdom. Now, it was a legitimate offer, and I always compare it to when Israel went up to the promised land under Moses, and what did God tell them? Go in and take it. It's yours to the taking. You won't lose one drop of blood, because I'm going to drive the Canaanites out. But did they believe it? No, they didn't believe it, and so they had all kinds of excuses. The cities were well fenced and the men were giants and oh they just whimpered all night and so God sent them back out into the desert all right now you had much the same thing at his first advent all the things were in place it was a valid offer yes hypothetically they could have had it but God knew they wouldn't and so the whole work of the cross was consummated because of Israel's unbelief and in their unbelief, they demanded his death. But you see, it was all so supernatural. And as we've seen even today, Israel stoned the prophets. Paul recognized that he was part of putting those followers of Jesus to death. And Rome didn't raise a fuss about that. But you see, the leaders of Israel were prompted providentially to bring Rome into the crucifixion because he had to be lifted up. He couldn't be killed by stoning. He had to be crucified. And so that brought the Romans into the picture, and that brought about, of course, the crucifixion, his burial, and his resurrection. All right, now we're just going to move over into his post-resurrection after the 40 days in the resurrected body, and we'll move into Acts chapter 1. <coughs> Because we are just trying to show how all of this unfolded according to God's timetable. But you have to understand the timetable to really understand where we are with regard to our doctrine. What do we believe? All right, in Acts chapter 1, now it's still Jewish. Nothing pertaining to Gentiles as yet. Saul of Tarsus hasn't been saved as yet. All right, verse 3. Well, let's take verse 2. Until the day in which he was taken up, that is his ascension, after that he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments unto the apostles, that is the eleven that are left, uh, Judas is gone, and so unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also, to the twelve, now eleven, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion, his death, burial, and resurrection by many infallible proofs. Now, you know, there have been people down through the ages who tried to prove that the resurrection of Christ was a hoax, but they come away from it invariably as believers because there was so much proof of his resurrection. All right? So they came with infallible proofs being seen of them Forty days. 
Forty days he spent with him in the resurrected body. And it's that 40-day period with Christ that we get a hint of our eternal body. It's going to be a body fashioned after his resurrected body. So that's the reason for these 40 days. And you pick them up in the closing chapters of the Gospels. <clears throat> All right, so 40 days, speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Now, fortunately, here about a year or two ago, we spent a whole series of programs distinguishing the difference between the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, and the body of Christ, if you remember that. The kingdom of God is that overall sphere of God's righteous influence, control. Heaven, the angels, all the Old Testament believers, all the New Testament believers, everything pertaining to God's righteousness can be included in that overall circle, the kingdom of God. But in the kingdom of God is that future kingdom of heaven, which is coming on the earth, which is predominantly in Israel's domain, although all the nations are going to reappear. But that's still future. Since it was rejected at Christ's first advent, it now has been postponed, and we are now calling out the body of Christ, and it too is in the kingdom of God. So when Paul says in, first, in uh, Colossians chapter 1 that we have been translated from darkness into the kingdom of his dear son, it's into the big circle, the kingdom of God, but it's also into the smaller circle, the body of Christ. So you have those three entities in Scripture, the overall kingdom of God, the promised kingdom of heaven on earth, and the body of Christ, which is now being called out. All right. So here we're just talking about the big picture, the kingdom of God. All right, verse 4. <clears throat> and being assembled together with them, the leaven, he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, he saith, you have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but you, speaking to the eleven who are representatives also of the nation of Israel, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit, a reference to Pentecost, not many days hence. Now verse 6 is an interesting verse. When they therefore were come together, Jesus and these eleven men, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel. Well, now, what kingdom in Israel's past was constantly a pleasant reminder for Israel? Well, David and Solomon. When Israel reached the peak of her glory, Lord, are you ready to restore us to such a kingdom? Well, he doesn't ridicule them. He doesn't say, now, wait a minute, where do you guys get such an idea? He merely says, like we say today, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of what? When? See? And that's what still is today. There's no ifs about the kingdom. It's coming. We just don't know when. Now, it looks like the whole world is getting ready for the coming of Christ. The whole political situation, the economic situation, the the spiritual, the ungodliness. It's all screaming that we're approaching the end time. But like I said in the first program, God's wheels can grow slowly, but we don't know when it'll be. But nevertheless, the world is setting the stage for Christ's second coming, at which time he will open up this kingdom promised to Israel. So, verse 7, <clears throat> it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. So again, we have that same scenario where Jesus said, It's not for you to know. But that doesn't mean it's not valid. It is 
coming. All right, now then, we'll just stay here in the first part of Acts for a little bit. Verse 8, Jesus is still speaking to the leaven, and he says, but regardless of when the kingdom comes, you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit is come upon you. Now, just not too many taming back, we did a series on the Holy Spirit. And let's come back. Just comes to mind. I didn't intend to do this, but come back with me to Luke 24. <clears throat> because this is what you and I have to still recognize that if we're going to be led and controlled by the Holy Spirit, we too want to be under this power from on high, which is the power of the Holy Spirit. See? Luke 24, 49. This is what Jesus is referring to in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. All got it? Luke 24, verse 49. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry or stay in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with what? Power from on high. And what is the power from on high? the power of the Holy Spirit operating on planet Earth. All right, now then if you'll come back to Acts chapter 1, verse 8, that's what he's telling the 11. Wait here in Jerusalem until you are endued with that power from on high, which is the coming of the Holy Spirit. And then reading on in verse 8, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria. Now, if you know your Bible, did they go any further? No, they never got any further. That's as far as they got. They didn't get to the uttermost part of the earth. Well, what happened? Israel's unbelief. Israel, the nation, is going to continue to reject everything concerning this promised kingdom because they couldn't buy into Jesus of Nazareth as that promised Messiah. How did they put it? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? See? And the nation went down the tube into dispersion, waiting now, of course, for God to come in and finish his second advent. But here we have it so plain that they never got any further than Samaria. They did not get to the uttermost part of the earth. But you know what? God's promises never fail. So how is Israel going to still fulfill this promise? Well, let me take you back to Matthew once again. Matthew 24. And maybe this will answer a lot of questions and save me a lot of letter writing. I sometimes think I should just make copies of some of my answers, but I don't like to do it that way, so I take the time to personally answer, but questions come in constantly with regard to the Great Commission. The Great Commission, you know all, you all know what it says. But I'm not going back to Great Commission, I'm going back to Matthew 24, where Jesus is speaking concerning the tribulation those final seven years before Christ returns. All right, verse, well, just to pick up the language. Verse 11, these are all prophecies from the Lord himself concerning these final seven years that Israel is going to have to go through. <clears throat> verse 11, and many false prophets shall arise and deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound. Are we seeing it? Oh, the world is just succumbing to it at every turn. It isn't just America. We're still the best. When you see the wickedness in the rest of the world, we're still fairly well blessed, believe me. But it's going to be global, see? And iniquity shall abound. 
and the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure, that is, through these seven years, unto the end, the same shall be saved. Physically. I don't think this is a spiritual connotation. They're going to survive physically. Now, a verse comes to mind, and I always feel that that's a hint the Lord wants me to take a, a run at it. Come back with me to Daniel. I mean, uh, Isaiah. Isaiah 24. Keep your hands in Matthew 24 I, and Acts 1. We're coming back. Isaiah 24. Now, this is Isaiah's picture of these final seven years. In the final days of them as is the Lord. Isaiah, the first of the major prophets, chapter 24, and I'm going to take time to read these verses so that you'll understand what the Lord is talking about in Matthew 24. Isaiah 24, verse 1. Behold, the Lord, that's the Old Testament term, remember, for God the Son, Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty, maketh it waste, and turneth it upside down, and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. And it shall be, it's going to happen, as with the people, so the priest, as with the servant, his master, as with the maid, so her mistress, the buyer, the seller, the lender, the borrower. In other words, the whole cross-section of a society is now involved. The land shall be utterly emptied because of the horrors of these final hours of the tribulation. For the Lord has spoken this word, the earth mourneth and fadeth away. In other words, all of its activity is going to come down to nothing. The earth fadeth away and the world languisheth and fadeth away. The haughty people of the earth do languish. Wealth isn't going to make a bit of difference. They're all going to come under the wrath of God. All right, verse 5, the earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof because they have transgressed the laws, they've changed the ordinance, they've broken the everlasting covenant. In other words, they've broken every possible thing that God used to control humanity. All right, now verse 6, <clears throat> therefore, because of man's total rebellion and depravity. Therefore has the curse devoured the earth, and they that dwell therein are desolate. There's no quality of life left. And therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and I say without any... Uh, Apology that this is going to be the nuclear unleashing of all the nuclear weapons that the world is accumulating. And the inhabitants of the earth are burned. But what are the last several words? A few men left. What does that mean? Now come back to Matthew 24. They've endured to the end. They've managed to stay alive. Oh, maybe they're under a pile of rubble, but they're a survivor. And these survivors, you see, are going to be brought before the king in Jerusalem. Now I've got to follow that up with Scripture, don't I? You're in Matthew 24. Just turn over to chapter 25. Here's where the survivors are going to end up. Now, this may not be good continuity, but bear with me. Matthew 25, we now have these survivors of Isaiah 24 brought before the king. Because remember, no unbelievers can go into the kingdom. So we got to sort out the unbelief of these survivors. All right, here it is. Verse 31. When the Son of Man, now that's the Son of God, it's Jesus the Christ. When he shall come in his glory, his second coming, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. Just like we saw a few programs back in Matthew 19. 
The twelve are going to rule from twelve thrones under the throne of Christ on Mount Zion in Jerusalem. And he shall sit upon the throne of his glory. Verse 32. Before him shall be gathered all nations. Now, wait a minute. How many people are left in the nations? Just a special few, a few of the survivors. The whole population goes. And that's why all these nukes are being accumulated. They're going to use them, but not until God gives permission to. And so there will be a few survivors, I feel, in every nation around the globe. And so those survivors are representatives then of the nations. That's all we've got here. Just a few, but enough to restart the human race. Okay? And so he brings them into Jerusalem, and then he separates them in verse 32. He separates them one for another as or like a shepherd divides sheep from the goats. Now, when you separate sheep from goats, that's easy enough to understand. The sheep go here and the goats go there. Well, that's what he's going to do with the believers from all these Gentile nations that have survived. He's going to separate the lost from the saved. All right? And uh, he sets the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. Then shall the king, see, this is at the onset of this earthly kingdom. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit or be part of the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. In other words, all the Old Testament is looking forward to this glorious earthly kingdom over which Christ is going to rule and reign. Well, then the rest, of course, explains how that the goats who represent the lost will be sent to their doom. All right, but back up again now to Matthew 24. So these survivors will have endured those seven years to the end, and they're going to be able to go in to the kingdom, see? But they can't go into the kingdom unless they've heard the gospel of salvation. Nothing is automatic. Every human being has to be presented with the plan of salvation, whether it's Old Testament, whether it's Christ's earthly kingdom gospel message, or whether it's us in the age of grace, we all have to make our personal affirmation of faith. All right, now verse 14. Here it's as plain again as English can make it. And Jesus is saying it. But... He that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom. Now, what's the key word? This. What does that indicate? What has now been preached in his earthly ministry for three years? This same gospel that he and the twelve have been preaching to Israel during the tribulation will be preached to the whole world, not just Jews, everyone. See? All right, so this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Who's going to have the glorious opportunity to take this gospel of the kingdom to the nation of the world? Jews. What Jews? The 144,000. Okay, back to Revelation. You're with me. I'm making headway. Back to Revelation chapter 7, verses 4 through 8. We've got the sealing or setting apart 12,000 young Jewish men from each one of the 12 tribes. So now you know what I tell people? I think... I can't prove it, but I think that they're already in Israel. I think these 12,000 Jews from every one of the 12 tribes are already in Israel. That's how close I think we are to the end. But see, here's the miracle of it. Who knows what tribe they belong to? God does. And in his sovereignty, he's going to have it arranged that they're going to be there. 
And again, I think, I can't prove from Scripture, but it seems logical to believe that these 144,000 young Jews are going to hear the preaching of the two witnesses that come in at the very opening of the tribulation. And from their preaching, the gospel of the kingdom, the king is coming, the kingdom is just over the horizon. See how it all fits? The king is coming. They don't need the gospel of grace. That's done. The church is gone. But the world at the end of the tribulation is going to finally have heard this gospel of the kingdom from these 144,000 Jews. All right, go on into verse 9. Now we see that these young men are literally going to reach every tribe and language and dialect on the planet, which is today impossible. My goodness, the last I read, there are still thousands of tribes that have never heard the gospel. These men are going to do it. All right, after this, verse 9, after they've been sealed, and I think this is on the very opening day of the tribulation, after this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of what? All the nations. See? Not just from Israel. All the nations and kindreds and people and tongues or languages. And they're all standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. What's happened? They've become believers of this gospel of the kingdom during the tribulation, and they're martyred as fast as they become believers. And so they're already in glory and waiting for the tribulation to be consummated. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God who sit upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about and about the elders and so on and so forth, blessing and glory. And then verse 13, And one of the elders answered, saying, me, Who are these arrayed in white robes, and where did they come from? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. Verse 14, And he said unto me, these are they who came out of great tribulation. They heard the gospel of the kingdom from these 144,000 Jews, and they believed it, and they were immediately martyred. That's the horrors of the tribulation. But on the other hand, you know what? I think they're going to be so glad to be martyred to get out from under the horrors of that period of time. And so none of this is hard to believe. And these are they who came out of the great tribulation, and they're martyred as fast as they became believers. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Veldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Veldick.